And, and so the next, next set of questions are, um, uh, how, many of you, how many have helped someone else to use Firefox? Okay, so that's pretty amazing, right there. Um, uh, and, and how many of you have helped like two people use Firefox? Uh, or more, like five, oh, 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 ten. Oh, oh, oh. Like, who thinks they have the highest number of people that they've introduced Firefox to? <laughs> Anybody over ten? Um, so another thing about uh, viral adoption of any kind of products is that there, there's a, a lot of researchers have, have studied this, and uh, the way that that products become viral is not that like one person starts using it and they introduce one other person to use it and you have that network effect, that expansion. It's usually, you have a small set or a smaller set of people and they um, infect or, or share their ideas or their products with a bunch of people. Um, and that's, uh, that kind of viral effect is, is what's happened with Firefox. So this is a this is a, a the growth of the internet number of users on the internet over time and the, and the different browsers that they use. So so you're all part of this big orange area up here um, that makes up you know now makes up 30 percent of the web. And back in 2003, um, there was only a handful of people. There were you know, we started out with one or two people you know uh, developing and starting to use Firefox. Um, and now there's over 450 million people in the world using Firefox. And if you, you know, if you know anything about Mozilla, we don't do advertising. The only way that this growth has come about is because of people like you that have tried it yourself and then have, have, have helped others to use Firefox. So you are a big contributor to, um, to changing the web. Uh, and, and for that, you, know, you are part of the Mozilla project. You are a contributor. You've made a difference in, in how the web is evolving. Um, uh, so the other thing about this chart is that it shows kind of waves of innovation, waves of, 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 of things happening. Um, if you look down on, on this end of the chart, back in the late 90s, um, you know, Netscape started out and it had a virtual monopoly on the browser market. When they first started, it had like 90% market share. Uh, but the internet was very small at that stage. Uh, and then Microsoft uh, started to compete in the market and created a monopoly, and they got up to 98% market share. Um, and, but some interesting things happened here. Um, in, the, in these early days, <coughs> Uh, there was a lot of innovation going on. Uh, there were these building blocks of the internet that were being created. Things like cookies and SSL, HTML4, JavaScript, plugins, CSS. All these were new innovations that made web pages easier to use uh, and made the web accessible and useful for more people. Uh, and then we moved to what I call the dark ages of the internet. So when Microsoft got to 98% market share, they, you know, there was no incentive. There wasn't a lot of revenue generated from the browser. Um, they weren't interested in, in uh, continuing to develop IE and, and advancing it. Uh, but at Mozilla, we were. Uh, and so, you know, we have this period of the dark ages of the internet where, um, you know, uh, we at Mozilla continued to try and improve the browser, but, but Microsoft wasn't going along with the program. Uh, and so it's been a constant battle since around 2001, 2002 to kind of drag them back, find ways that we can influence Microsoft and Opera and you know, eventually Google and Safari to start creating browsers to, uh, to advance the set of standards to adopt the set of standards that were already defined uh, and start advancing the web. So that's what started to happen 
when Firefox market share took off without people like you helping to build market share to help create some influence, we wouldn't have been able to bring Microsoft back to the table, back to the browser development. And the web would have stagnated. Essentially, it would have been frozen in time uh, with the IE6. Um, so that's a pretty major accomplishment. So I mentioned that, you know, so there, we had the surge and innovation and new features going to, into browsers. There was this stagnation period for, for several years. Um, and we're right on the verge of that changing again. The, in, in, over the next six months, we've got um, IE9, new versions of Chrome, Firefox 4. Um, and th these browsers have a tremendous amount of new building blocks to create to improve the web. <coughs> and you know the, the kind of the buzzword for this is HTML5. But HTML5 is not one thing. It's a collection of many innovative technologies that, that web developers can start to use as soon as the browser starts to go up. So things like open video, SVG, canvas, geolocation, multi-touch, accelerated graphics, offline web applications, drag and drop file upload. These are all things that are going to be built into all of those browsers. And, and just like the web moved very quickly many years ago, it's going to take off again. Uh, and it's going to change the way that people use the web. There's, there's a lot of change coming. So it, you know, our mission remains the same, though. We want to continue to be able to influence the direction of the web. We've seen when one company dominates or, or a few companies dominate the technology, uh, it can stagnate, it can move in the wrong directions. So we want to build a strong community of people that, that want to continue to influence the direction of the web and steer it in a way that keeps the web open, keeps it innovating. So, so, so we had a bunch of early Firefox users. Uh, how many recognize this browser? So we've got a bunch of early Netscape users as well. <laughs> so this is version uh, 2, 202 of Netscape. Um, and you know, it's got a location bar, it's got some buttons. You know, there's, there's been tweaking to the UI that's happened. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in, in some ways, you know, the browser looks a lot like it did back in 1998. If you sweat your eyes, you can you know, see all the major features there. Uh, we've kind of been tweaking around the edges. Um, and then there was this period of stagnation where you know none of the core development was going on, uh, and it's it's probably good to uh, if, if we want to find ways that we can sustain innovation and we can keep it going the way that it's happened in just the last few years and, and will take off in the next few years, we, we we need to develop some perspective. Like where are we at in this in the stage of development of the browser? Uh, so one way to, if we can compare two other industries, we could compare it to the auto industry. So back in, uh, in 1908, the Model T was introduced, and it was the first time when automobiles became accessible to the general public, affordable, people could use them, people could understand how to operate them. And so the automobile industry started to take off. And in some ways, you know, that's the equivalent to the Netscape browser. Um, and we, we moved from a stage where it was just enthusiasts. How many used the internet before Netscape? Okay. So uh, if you remember, so you had to, you had, it was a series of command lines. So to view an image, you would probably bring up a program like FTP. You would go to uh, you know, a site like NASA or someplace that was storing interesting image. You would. You would transverse down the directory structure to find a, an image that you thought would be interesting. You'd download it, and then you'd unzip the image, and then you'd bring up a program like Paint to view the image. So there's like 20, 20 steps to, to accomplish something, now it's one click. Um, so those kinds of innovations have to come together before you can get a significant people 
number of people to, uh, to start to, to use the technology. Um, uh, and, and so the auto industry goes along for 50 years. And then in the 50s and 60s, the emphasis became um, trying to make cars faster uh, and trying to introduce you know, some, uh, some interesting design to attract people. Uh, and in some ways, that's kind of where we are now. Like we have this intense competition going on between the different browser JavaScript engines. Uh, we've got uh, you know, personas and, and uh, uh, you know, we have studies that kind of measure and track performance and, and changes to the user interface. You know, we're, we're in this constant battle now where like we're trying, you know, the, the race is on to see how many pixels can be removed from the, from the user interface of the browser. So we're, there's a lot of focus on style and there's a lot of focus on performance that's going on now that's equivalent to the auto industry. So it, it's only taken us, you know, 10 years to go as far as the auto, auto industry went in 50 years. Um, uh, but, uh, but we're still, you know, maybe not advanced as far as advanced as we, as we think we might be. So in, in 1973, um, the Mercedes S class was, was introduced. And it was the first automobile that had anti-lock braking systems, airbags and seatbelts and electronic tracking control, a lot of safety features. So there's a few safety features that have been built into the browser. Uh, we have uh, 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 safe browsing where we use a service and it feeds down information about dangerous sites. And if you, if you happen to get redirected or you stumble onto one of these dangerous sites, it's like an airbag that comes up. Uh, but, there's, but, but if there's not standards weight, standardization of, of, uh, of that feature, uh, each safe browsing feature in each browser works slightly different. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we, we may be somewhere around 1973 with the development of browser technology. Um, the other part about this, this, you know, the S-Class uh, introduced a bunch of new technology and then, uh, and then several years later, they became standards and all automobiles adopted those things. And that's a, that's a lot like we see development of the browser. Um, and it's a tricky interaction between integration of standards and trying to keep innovating. Uh, so there's two, there's several different directions this this can work. It can be like the like, like the Mercedes. It can you can take a set of features and that have been successful and been proven, and you can turn those into a standard and get them uh, adopted across the industry. Uh, so it's a matter of harvesting the, the, the feature work, consolidating it, and turning it into standards. Um, but browser vendors haven't always done a good job of this, um, mostly because it's, it's a frustrating and painful process to go through standardization. Uh, so the, the, the whole browser industry needs to, to focus more on this now that we're innovating. More. There'll be more opportunities for that. The other is to take a stand, you know, just define the standard kind of uh, uh, in the dark, and then uh, try and get that standard adopted and turn it into features uh, in, in individual or, or all the browsers. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a harder approach, uh, but if you're developing some technology and you think, you know, Trying to, to trying to get it uh, defined as a standard is the way that things like video and accessibility features have gone into Firefox. Uh, so, so there's another kind of interesting angle to standards. How many are familiar with the ACID three test? Okay, and you and so everyone in this room knows that you know Firefox's score on ACID three is 97 out of 100. Um, so what's the story behind that? Um, well, you know, 97 out of 100 can be okay. Uh, and, and 100 out of 100 is really avoiding the critical questions that need to be uh, 
uh, asked about uh, how each of the browsers are performing. So, so what's happened is that uh, the, the three points that Firefox is missing are that uh, there's, there are a few tests in ACID3 that test a feature called SVG fonts. And uh, all of the other browser vendors have, have e implemented enough of SVG fonts just so they can pass the ACID3 test. But there's a whole other set of issues that they didn't go through and, and, and are not making it into the press or are not making it into the minds of the developers on their teams is that, first of all, there's, a, there's an alternate technology called uh, Web Open Fonts, the Web Open Font Format, WOFF, um, that provides a parallel set of features to SVG fonts. Um, and that may be good enough. We may not have to adopt both, both, both sets, sets of technologies uh, because the other browsers haven't adopted the full set of SVG fonts as well. They've adopted just enough to, um, uh, to pass the, uh, the ACID3 test. Um, uh, so, so there's some interesting, you know, if you're, if you're interested in reading more, um, one of the Netscape uh, user experience people uh, uh, Alexander Lee wrote an article on this, and uh, you, know, you, can, you can search and find it. But it raises the issues. I mean, what we should be talking about is, do we need SVG fonts? Uh, is, there, is the, is the, is the um, raw format good enough? Uh, and, and can actually anybody really implement all of SVG in a way that it's spec'd out? There's some issues around that as well. We should be having those conversations, and we shouldn't be having the conversation of, you know, everybody has 100% adoption except for Firefox on SM3. Um, so, so let's get back to, to, you know, this comparison to the auto industry. Um, there's still some challenges that, like, the auto industry has started to innovate and advance again, uh, you know, largely driven by oil prices. Uh, and they've done a lot of interesting uh, new technology to, to, to make cars more economical. Uh, and that's probably an area where browsers will go next. You know, we've made some choices in Firefox 4 that optimize on speed, but not necessarily memory use. So we may have to revisit those. Uh, and uh, we may have to find, you know, solutions that not only give us performance, but also they're economical in terms of memory use. Um, so this is the test of the number of units there. Um, but, so you can have a car that goes 200 kilometers per hour, uh, and, it, and it's one cent a kilometer to, to operate. Uh, and that's about one-tenth of the uh, uh, operational cost of a gasoline vehicle. So, so there's, you know, if we look to, to this other industry about, you know, where might things go next, you know, uh, uh, effective use of uh, the computing resources that people have, and not, uh, you know, not only on desktop, but laptops and mobile devices, we need to start to focus on slimming down the browser, maintaining its, its speed, its functionality, uh, but, but focus on additional areas. So, so kind of the lessons learned through, you know, this comparison to the auto industry. You know, keeping these combinations uh, of safe and easy and fast and compatible and stable and predictable are pretty important in, in not only individual features, but in the browsers general. And that's the way that people evaluate browsers. If there's one critical element of those five or six things that are, that's missing, like people just latch onto that and they move to a different product. That's what happened with Internet Explorer. It was insecure. And people were looking for other solutions and they found Firefox and it, and it solved their problem. Um, for many years, Opera was the fastest browser, but no one adopted it uh, because it had limitations and being easy to use, being compatible with websites. Uh, so it's, it's pretty crit critical to, to uh, but it's also hard 
to look at all of those things and try and create the right balance. Uh, so other ingredients for innovation uh, you can talk about. Uh, one of the things that, that's allowed us to, to, to uh, uh, innovate with Firefox is that like we've tapped into people who have a real passion for creating browsers and for making the web better. Um, and this initiative, Compassion, has, has been with us through the entire lifetime of the Mozilla Project. Um, and the most recent example is um, there's a 12-year-old there's a kid named Alex Miller who figured out how to download the Mozilla code and, and do some security research. And he, he's found critical security bugs in Firefox. And, and he's participating in our web bounty program. We paid him $6,000 over the last few months for, for doing this research, reporting the bugs to us, you know, doing a responsible disclosure. Uh, and, uh, you know, if a six-year-old kid can, you know, there's, there, there's lots of challenges to anyone trying to figure out the Mozilla code. But it's an example of like someone taking enough initiative to go through and figure out how to get things done in this very large software project. Um, so it's pretty impressive. But, it, but that kind of thing has been happening for, for, uh, for the last decade. Uh, the other thing to think about when you're, uh, you know, if you've got an idea for a feature uh, uh, and you want to see it through to completion, is really, really trying to, to understand what problems it's solving and how much impact it will have, not only for you, but are, are there other people that are running into the same kind of problem uh, and, and uh, are looking for the same kind of solution that you are. Uh, uh, there, so once you've got kind of a description of the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, there's a lot of creative things going on with uh, you know, creating videos that kind of describe the problem and your approach to to uh, uh, to creating the feature. Uh, so here's a, here's 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 an example of that. So so even if you don't have any coding skills, how many how many are programmers in the audience? So yeah, a large number. Um, if, if even if you don't have programming skills. You can create one of these videos describing your problem in enough detail that, that people can start to look at it and, and figure out if they, if they can come up with a solution to the problem. And if you do have coding skills, I think this is becoming a more and more critical part to the, to the development, um, is for you to be able to explain the feature work that you're doing to others so that you can get it integrated and adopted. So here's kind of an example. Separate tasks separate. So this, this is already discovered. You can use the panorama button to begin organizing your tabs. You can then click on a tab or hit escape to go back. Of course, you can click any tab to activate that tab. Alternatively, you can use option. So this is an idea, you know, the, creating these videos is an idea um, where you're explaining the feature um, and kind of going through the motion of <coughs> how you think it should work. And all of this went on just with like prototype code uh, before this feature called Panorama was included in, uh, in, in Firefox, uh, in Firefox 4 betas. Uh, uh, and and you know, we've, we're, we're doing this not only for user-facing features, uh, but also for, you know, we introduced WebGL into the Firefox mobile browser. Um, so here's another video of, you know, showing how uh, WebGL works. Hi, my name is Larry Kitchich, and I wanted to show you some WebGL demos running on a mobile phone. Here we've got a WebGL demo running inside Firefox on a PS900 device. It's a simple demo. We're just drawing a classic debug model and letting the user rotate it around. You can see it's pretty performant, even though we've done all this no optimization work on WebGL these devices yet. This is really the first build where I've kind of gotten things to work. Uh, here's another demo where developer Dog Albrecht has ported a pretty neat effect to WebGL. This demo is creating the effect with a uh, complex OpenGL shader and it's running pretty well on the device. Uh, one of the goals of WebGL was to make it possible to create free web content that would run on both mobile and desktop devices. And I think that we're definitely heading in that direction. The third demo 
this one that I wrote. So, let's so, so that's an example of you know someone you know Vlad who's, who's been working on WebGL for many years, trying to get it adopted as a standard, trying to get other browser vendors to to adopt that technology, and trying to get it integrated into Mozilla. He's gone through. He's not only explained what problem he's trying to solve, but he's also giving some 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 great demos of how the technology can be used. Um, and um, so, so that's becoming more and more of a critical path to, to getting features into Firefox. Um, kind of building a community of people that are interested in the technology even before it's, it's, it's fully created. Um, uh, so the, the, other, the other thing that, you know, another kind of lesson learned is that some people take the approach that like there's something that really that Firefox really needs to do, and they've got an idea about exactly how it it, um, it should be implemented. And um, since there's no running code for that, um, it's really better if if that, if you step back and <coughs> you approach it like an experiment. Um, you 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 know define what it is that you're trying to do, and you're creating some metrics for success. And uh, the one thing about innovation is that you have to try, you know, hundreds or thousands of things be before eventually you, you, you latch on to the best solution. Uh, so, so using a, a scientific approach to go through the development process is, is pretty effective. Uh, and then all the things that are part of open source. There's, you know, most of innovation, the way that people think about it, is is comes through. Um, you know, proprietary technology development. Uh, and, and we're trying to change that. We're trying to get people to embrace a new idea where you can be open, you can share ideas, and that and innovation will actually speed up by doing that. Uh, and, and then the last point here is, uh, is about, uh, you know, if you come up with an idea, it's pretty likely that someone well, already have had something similar to that. Um, you know, there's 10,000 different add-ons for Firefox. You know, different people trying out experiments. So, you know, that's a place where you can go look to find out. Has anyone done work in this area before? Is there anything that you can leverage and help to move forward? Um, and so, like, like I was talking about with the auto industry, you know, there's still opportunities to make the browser go faster. There's still opportunities to make it more secure and to keep users in control. Uh, and you know, navigation to web content is still a problem that we're trying to deal with. Um, making that easier uh, is, is. And so you look back through these different areas of opportunity. Um, and, um, they're, and, and they're kind of all over. Um, and what, so, so the best way to do that is to, you know, look for, for, for areas where people are struggling in their use of the browser, either yourself or, you know, things that you observe, um, and, and try and identify these areas of tension. Um, so, so one area that's, that's pretty obvious, uh, how many attended the keynote, Evan's keynote this morning? So, so there's a little bit of tension going on between using the web for social interaction and wanting to maintain privacy and anonymity. Uh, and uh, so this is a great area for innovation. Uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Google have kind of created a monopoly on the way that people think about social inter interaction and using web services. And just like, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago, Microsoft created a monopoly on web browser. We need to find ways to break that monopoly down. And we need to find ways for people to think about social interaction and use of the web in different ways. Uh, so there's a security researcher called Moxie Marlin Spike. He's, he's done a pretty good job of articulating some of the problems that, that, that he sees. And so what people really want uh, when they're sharing information over the web, they want to communicate with their friends and family. You don't necessarily want to communicate with the, the company Facebook or the company Twitter. 
They don't need to be a part of every single detail that goes on in your interaction with your friends. But you still want to be able to communicate with your friends. So just taking that idea kind of like turns the whole uh, economic and development model that's, that's going on is if we can focus on creating an interaction model between people rather than through centralized services, we'll probably be a lot better off. Uh, so, so the other thing that's kind of obvious is that, that, that users aren't part of this debate. We're kind of being dictated in terms of of, of, and the, and the trade-offs that are going to be, uh, that, that people are making. And it's, it, the, the terms of the, the debate are, well, do you want targeted services, or do you want anonymity and privacy? You can't have both. Well, it's, if you, if you state the question that way, it's probably true, but there, there, there may be alternate ways that we can go around creating this. So we've got you, and you've got all of the sites, that you visit, and you have ad networks and ad analytics companies, and they're all they're all collecting your browser history as you move around the web. And you know the, the, the parts of the players that are in the debate now are the ad networks and the sites. Uh, but there's no kind of user voice in what's going on, uh, and the attitude of the websites. And, and, um, and the ad networks and analytics companies are, uh, you know, basically you have no you have no privacy on the internet, so get over it. And one thing that we want to do in Firefox 4 uh, is, is to break down some of these ideas. Uh, because what we can see now is that privacy is at an all-time high, or surveillance is at an all-time high, and privacy is at an all-time low. And if we state the terms of the debate of that's the situation that we're in. We're, that might be a way to mobilize a lot of people in, in bringing a bigger voice to, to this debate that's going on. So we have an opportunity now. Uh, you know, governments are more interested in what's going on. Uh, the websites uh, are, you know, there's some uh, <coughs> that want to participate in better solutions. And so we're implementing a feature in Firefox 4 called Do Not Track. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, innovation comes when you try hundreds of experiments and you, and you finally latch on to one. So this is, this is one of many experiments that we want to try. And basically, we're going to have a setting in the browser where you can go in and you can say, I want to be served targeted ads. You can check that box. Or you can check the box that says, Do Not Track Me. And when you set that in Firefox, uh, uh, when, whenever you visit a website, when you first make the connection to the website, the HTTP header will, will, will provide that information in a standard way. And we'll start to tell websites and ad networks and analytics companies that I don't want to be tracked anymore. And you know, on, on the Mozilla site, we'll We'll also monitor how many of these pings that we're getting that says, I don't want to be tracked. And we'll publish that information so uh, the whole industry can start to understand how many users out there feel this way about the problem, that they don't want to be tracked. Uh, and we'll try and use this to pressure uh, the websites and analytics companies to start to rethink their services so that they can either provide both kinds of services, and we went along using the web for decades uh, without a lot of tracking going on. But now, you know, there's there's this big rush. The, the only way that advertisers can make money is that if they have targeted ads. Uh, you know, I don't think that's true, and so this is one way that users are going to be able to to provide a voice. Uh, have you decided the default values for those settings? Pardon? Have you decided the default values? The default values. So that's that's also an interesting question. So we thought about this a lot, and and we could have set the default value to be don't track me. That's kind of what we all believe about on the development team. Is you know that's that's what we should be saying there. 
Um, there's another way to look at it is, you know, we've gone 15 years where kind of the default settings of the web were to allow third-party cookies to go through, to allow uh, CSS visited uh, uh, ways to, uh, to, uh, to, to we have the technology on the browser and on the web services is basically set up to allow tracking uh, through kind of uh, misuse of the original protocol ideas. But anyway, so we've, we've had uh, tracking uh, integrated. So, so for those two things, we, we, we thought, well, since the default has kind of been uh, to allow tracking, and if we change the, if we, if we put do not track me as the default for every user, basically what we're saying is, we're, it's a message from Mozilla to all the websites to say, you know, Mozilla thinks that this user doesn't want to be tracked. So we, we thought, you know, the, the best way to allow the user to have a voice in the, is to send no setting is the default. Uh, and so there's actually three settings going on. You know, no setting is what your browser comes with. If you've gone into the user interface, you can check either one of those. And so that's the user being able to communicate what their intentions are. Um, and so this was just introduced uh, a few days ago into the code. Uh, how many are Firefox 4 beta users? All right. Um, so, so today, I hope you all go down or go, you know, today or tomorrow, go download Firefox for beta 11 um, and go into the advanced preferences section and check, check the box. Uh, they, this, the, I want to be served targeted ads hasn't made it into the UI. Um, <laughs> because we think like the early adopters of this aren't really interested. And because there's lots of uh, technical uh, things to overcome to, to set that kind of UI up. We can actually use some help if anyone's a Zool hacker. Uh, you know, it was a core technology guy who did all the implementation for this, so he's not good at the user interface part. Um, uh, but if you want to if you want to contribute to that, uh, we can use some help. Uh, and so, so, you know, we can start right here. Um, you know, 10 years from now, I can come back to the conference and I can say, how many set do not track on the weekend that was introduced? And you guys will be the start of the wave, just like you were starting the wave when, when uh, Firefox was shipped. Uh, there's another privacy setting that's going into the Firefox. And this is kind of the reverse. So like we're racing to get Do Not Track into Firefox 4, and there's a very compressed schedule, and like we've only implemented half the UI that we wanted. Um, you know, this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a problem on the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is, uh, how many are familiar with uh, CSS visited? Is a property you can set in CSS. OK, pretty good one. Um, <coughs> So, so this has been around since the introduction of CSS, and websites can actually figure out what sites you visited by giving you a set of links and setting this visited property on it. So they can see uh, changes in the layout when we change the colors of the links uh, in the web page that you see. So the idea was in this feature was let's change the colors and, and layout of the page. So that you can you can see whether or not you visited a site when it appears as a link in the page. Uh, but it also allowed websites to, to track your movements around the web. Um, so David Barron, one of the one of the uh, developers uh, and uh, one of the people that works on the CSS. So we've been thinking about a way, you know, for, for almost a decade now, that we can maintain the, the value of the feature to the user, but also uh, make it so sites can't track you. So, he's, you know, finally after nine years of working on this, he's come up with a solution that's been integrated into Firefox 4. Um, and uh, Chrome has also adopted his code. They, they, they've taken it in. And we want to get all browser vendors to adopt this. Uh, so that's that's kind of you know two 
you know, two completed things. You know, one has taken a long, a decade. Uh, you know, the other hopefully will be successful in a much shorter time. Uh, so, you know, then, then we have a variety of programs that are set up so that if you do come up with your own feature ID idea, um, you, there's funding available for you to explore those ideas. Uh, how many of your students? Do you? So, any of you ever participate in the Google Summer of Code? Yeah, one. So, this is a very interesting program that you can, you know, you get a stipend for Google and you can work on open source projects. And we've had um, uh, one of the students a couple years ago uh, uh, did the implementation for websites for Firefox. Uh, so you can, you know, you basically can pick the uh, project that you want to work on. You write up a specification of what you want to do. There's a committee that evaluates and, and they select about uh, 10 to 12 projects a year to work on Firefox. Um, and then we also have uh, other internship programs. Um, we have uh, security bug bounties and, and security research contracts. Um, and uh, we also have ways to test out um, your ideas with a, a program called Test Pilot that's um, integrated into the betas. And we ask users if they want to opt in to sending information about the individual studies that, we, that we're running. So we can start to uh, gather, collect up statistics on how many tabs people have open, how many bookmarks, uh, how they use the browser. So it's allowing us to, uh, to design the features a lot better. Uh, so there's opportunities for you to create one of these studies. There's also opportunities to help us evaluate the data uh, and, and display it in an interesting ways so that we can learn more from it. Uh, and then, uh, how many are how many are add-on users? All right, maybe seventy-five percent. Um, um, so, you know, it's add-ons add are a way to see what kind of experiments the people are doing. That was the intention of, of add-ons: is to allow allow people to experiment uh, uh, and try out new ideas. Uh, and there's, uh, there's, there's a replacement for the add-on system called Jetpack. Uh, and uh, uh, should make add-on developer development easier. And there's also uh, a project called Chromeless, which, which is, allows people to create uh, a user interface, uh, an application user interface just based on HTML. Uh, so that you don't have to know the Zool language that Firefox is built on. Uh, so, so those are those are a lot of the ideas about how you can participate. Uh, different different ways that you can plug in to, you know, taking some ideas that you have, uh, you know, working with others, and uh, and help us to innovate and uh, and improve Firefox. Uh, so. Just a few, a few more ways. So I think I'm almost out of time. If there's any any questions, we can kind of wrap up now. So how do you decide which features you want to implement in the next series of projects? What's the process? Mostly, we try and uh, uh, shift the responsibility for making decisions about any area of the code to the to the owners. <coughs> of the specific area of code. So if it's a networking feature, there's someone who is the module owner of the networking code, and they make decisions on what features go in or out. So there's, a, there's about 100 different functional areas of the browser and 100 different module owners. Um, so it's a pretty complicated process, uh, especially if you're developing a feature that spans a number of modules. Like you basically have to convince you know, a, a wide group of people um, just through discussions and bugs, exchange of ideas, and try and build consensus. Um, yeah, yeah, there are mailing lists, wiki pages, uh, uh, and and through the bug system. It's kind of someone will, you know, they'll, you know, hopefully they'll 
you know, they'll write up a blog post on what they're trying to do or create one of these videos on what they're trying to accomplish. They might write a specification and put it on the, our uh, mozilla.org wiki. Um, and then they might open a bug and start attaching patches to the bug. Then they'll try and get the module owners to uh, review the patches, provide feedback, or it's like, you know, it might go through several iterations of trying to make the code more compatible with the existing architecture. They'll get lots of feedback through this peer review process that every change goes through. Um, and then if everyone kind of decides, yeah, now it's ready, then it gets checked in. Have any add-ons made in the There's quite a few. Um, I'm having a hard time twisting my mind. Sync started out, you know, the Firefox Sync uh, started out as an add-on, it's being integrated. Um, uh, the, the, the search engine search bar thing, you know, originally started out as an add-on. Uh, uh, some of the uh, awesome bar features, uh, the search your browser history, and, and Sites. Some of those were started out as for some reason started out. A lot of the projects that we worked on in labs started out as add-ons, and then as they evolved to a certain state, then they started to get consideration too. So it's a good place to test out ideas. Okay, uh, thanks for coming. And uh,